Well, I'm personally really excited about today's program um, because I think education is really foundational to the success and prosperity of our community. Um, you know, it not only affects the quality of our future workforce, but also is really important in attracting today's workers to our area. And uh, so it's very fitting to begin the year with uh, a program like we have today. So let's get started. Um, today we're going to hear from the superintendents of the Kennewick Pasco and Richland School Districts. So help me welcome all three superintendents to the stage as I introduce them. And presenting first is Dr. Shelley Redinger. Dr. Redinger became superintendent of the Richland School District in June of 2020. One of her first teaching jobs was in the second grade classroom at Jefferson Elementary. And incidentally, one of my first educational experiences as a student was in the second grade class at Jefferson was Elementary. So probably not the same time. Uh, she then went on to become a principal at Sacagawea Elementary and then the district's director of teaching and learning before departing to advance her career, including becoming superintendent of the Oregon Trail School District in Sandy, Oregon, and of the Spotsylvania School District in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Before returning to Richland, Dr. Renger spent eight years as superintendent of the Spokane Public Schools, which is the second largest school district in our state. Dr. Redger holds a bachelor's and master's degree in education from Washington State University and a master's and doctorate in educational administration from the University of South Carolina. She and her husband, a mechanical engineer, have one son. So please help me introduce or help me welcome Dr. Shelley Redinger. It's always hard to go first, plus I'm really short. Hopefully Michelle's next, because it's nice because we're all about the same size. So. <laughs> Don't have to keep moving it up and down. Um, so do we have a clicker? Oh, here's the clicker, okay. So I'm gonna talk about a few things today, um, and I was, thank you for that introduction. Is uh, I love uh, Richland. I started my career, I spent most of my career in the Richland School District, so it's like coming home for me, so. Um, just wanted to say that little piece. It has changed over the years. Richland's really, really grown. I remember our first house was in Country Ridge, and it was like way out in the country, Country Ridge housing development, and it's sure changed. Um, so just a, a few things about the state of education in Richland schools. So we are, we've been through a lot, as you know. I came back, um, and it was quite a busy time with COVID and a lot of changes going on. And, uh, but I'm happy to say that enrollment has stabilized. Uh, we're, we're back to pre-pandemic levels. And so we, uh, when it hit, we were at 13,600 13, students. And I'm happy to say today we're at 13,600 plus some. So we're feeling good about that. Um, student reading and math scores are continuing to improve. And uh, we were able to pass our EPNO and technology levies in February. Um, so go on from there. We do have a strategic plan. We're so excited about this. As you know, I have a long history in the Richland School District, and it has a long sorted history with strategic plans. Every time a superintendent would try to do a draft strategic plan, they were fired. So I'm happy to say I'm still here, and we have one in place, and uh, we're very, very excited about it. So we had a lot of community involvement and um, we're very excited about it. So it was adopted this past fall, um, and we're doing some other things. We're fast-tracking our early literacy curriculum adoption. Um, it's called structured literacy. Uh, really going back in time, those of us that um, had phonics instruction, it's really going back to that. So students have the basic skills to be able to read. Um, and then some of you, I'm so sorry if you were in the whole language movement, um, hopefully you can read my slides. So, uh, but as you know, we are, we're very excited to be focusing on this as we're moving forward. Uh, also, social emotional learning, we've been working on that as well, um, because students have a lot of mental health needs right now. Um, and it's, it's a little scary, the amount of needs that our students have, and so we're really focusing on that. Um, all right, so. We, we, our whole theme of our strategic plan is Richland Ready, and it's about preparing students for their future and our community's future. And so we're very, it's critical to the Richland School District that we have very rigorous academics and choices so we can meet the needs of all students. Um, more and more we want to work with businesses and partners. I, you know, Gisa, I thought that was a great 
kickoff, it's great that they're a sponsor because they are a key partner for us and um, in our school district and it shows how much they care and so it's not just about checking a box to our business partners they truly care and help us become the best we can be um, and so in our new strategic plan also we have very clear metrics that we will continue to share with our community on where we're going so i want to talk a little bit about our cte pathways so career and technical education um, we have quite a few things that we have that we we'll continue to expand. And I gave them a heads up, I was gonna do a quick shout out. We have an amazing CTE director in the Richland School District, and he is here today. So Ryan Beard, could you please stand? I wanna everyone give him a big hand, he's awesome. <laughs> So those of you that have worked with Ryan know he is, he is amazing. So thank you, Ryan, for being here today. So these are some of our main pathways in the Richland School District. We have family and consumer science, skilled and technical, health science, agriculture, which is continuing to grow and expand, science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, of course, in this region that is critical to our economic infrastructure, and then business and marketing as well. So we have a few things um, that we've really been adding to our career and technical education partnerships with our business community. So we have 92 courses now, and CTE, a CTE course is required in our state for high school graduation. So all of our students get a chance to be exposed to these courses. Uh, we're up, we're really focusing on the middle school, and after this meeting I wanna talk to Gisa about would they be willing to set up a credit union in our middle schools because we're finding that sometimes the high school, it's a little late. Uh, our, if our middle school students understand more about money, um, you know, even if it's just money in their piggy bank, they've gotta understand saving and savings and how it all works. So um, we're doing great on our targets out there. I'm gonna keep moving here. So we have so many community partners, and these are just, and hopefully if you partner with us and you're not on this list, I really, really apologize, but this is just an example of the number of businesses that partner with us to help prepare our students for either the job market or moving on to post-secondary. So just a, a few celebrations. Uh, we've received numerous awards in computer science, robotics, agriculture, and broadcasting, and our staff has been re recognized regionally for these areas. So this is really cool. This just happened, the second part here, nationally recognized program. So I'm gonna brag about Ryan a little bit more. So he is known around the state as uh, just really thinking outside the box, partnering. And so we were chosen, uh, the Richland School District, among only a few districts from seven states across the country. So Rhode Island, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, Colorado, and Washington. Um, I'm excited North Carolina's gonna be there. I'll, I'll probably start talking in my southern accent again my days of being in South Carolina. My husband worked for Westinghouse there, that's why we went there. Um, but we were invited to participate in a national initiative to build a framework for successful and equitable student career pathways and supports. So it's the beginning of a cohort and we will continue to meet and uh, our first convening is in New Orleans. And I'm excited because it's not hurricane season. Um, and so we'll be going there and get a chance to really get to know and work and continue these business partnerships because Tennessee has some really neat things going on and Kentucky with their schools and their businesses. So I'm, we're really looking forward. And so we will be representing uh, one of the districts representing our state in this. And I, again, it's, it's because of Ryan's work. You've probably seen this in the newspaper. Uh, we were just accepted. We have been on a waiting list for 10 years for an Army a uh, junior ROTC program. It really is about leadership experiences. It's a four-year program in, within Hanford High School, and students um, going to our other high schools can elect to join that, but we're real excited because it really is based on leadership and uh, helping set students up for success and other options going forward. Uh, we started ASL, American Sign Language Courses. That's a CTE course, and thanks to Ryan, he was able to get that for us. That counts as a CTE credit or actually a world language credit. And then he's working on future middle school courses, journalism, health science, and others as well as that financial literacy I'll, uh, we'll be talking about hopefully with Gisa. Okay, I'm gonna really run through this quickly because there's three of us and I don't wanna 
take all the time. So uh, just real quickly, this is a little bit about our capital projects levy. And um, usually it's bonds are for buildings, levies are for learning. So bonds are still for buildings and levies are still for learning, but there's a capital projects levy that you can do some building. So I know that confuses the heck out of everybody, but do you know that this, it's paid off a lot quicker, six years, and you can do renovations. And so this is for us to renovate for our safe, safety and security. So why a new levy? Uh, we need our school security infrastructure has changed and we have enrollment growth in grades nine through 12 leading to overcapacity. So I just wanna go through this really quickly. There's flyers on the back table uh, that highlight all of these slides. So does anyone know what this land is? Does that look familiar? So this is the land that we had purchased a while ago uh, from the farmer that owns all this land, who's a great, uh, Alexander, a great partner. This is the site for our third comprehensive high school. It's behind the new district office. So we're way out there in West Richland. Uh, and so that is where it would go. So we own that land. So the levy would allow us to do all these safety upgrades as well as plan uh, what would be the programming, what would be the focus for a third comprehensive high school. We all know Richland and Hanford have long histories of great programs, and so it would be a community effort there. Um, also River's Edge, and then in addition to three, River's Home Lake. This shows you um, what it would cost. And so this is, we have an online calculator, so you just put in your assessed value of your home, and you would see exactly what that uh, bill if you're a Richland, uh, Richland resident. So, and we have all the details here. So I wanted to go through that part pretty quickly. I do not want to take time from my two colleagues. So if you have questions, please give me a call. Thank you for supporting our students. Thank you, Dr. Renninger. That was a lot to be, a lot to be excited about and, and proud of. Um, let me also mention, too, that um, at the conclusion of, of the talks, we're going to try to reserve some time for some Q&A. So as, as, you're, as you're listening, you might kind of jot down a couple of questions if, if something uh, comes to mind. So next, we'll hear from Dr. Tracy Pierce. Uh, Dr. Pierce has served as Kennewick School District Superintendent since January of 2020. Under her leadership, the district worked collaboratively with parents, students, uh, staff, uh, to develop a new strategic plan. The plan is monitored and updated annually and it includes district, community, family, staff, and student focused goals to support the district's mission. Prior to coming to Kennewick, Dr. Pierce spent 24 years in the Lake Washington School District, including six as superintendent. Dr. Pierce began her career as a teacher, later becoming an assistant principal, principal, instructional technology coordinator, teaching and learning director, chief schools officer and deputy superintendent before moving into the superintendent post. She holds a bachelor's degree in English and a master's degree in educational leadership. In 2009, she earned her doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies and superintendent certificate from the University of Washington. So please help me welcome Dr. Tracy Pierce. Well, thank you so much. It's great to be here this afternoon and so great to see all of you. And I really appreciate having a few minutes of time uh, to talk with you about the state of Kennewick schools. And I'd like to begin with the slide that you see in front of you because it has so many great pictures of Kennewick students. And of course, that's why we're here to serve our students. Today, I'm going to highlight, I, I could probably use all of the time, but I know Michelle wouldn't appreciate that very much, so I'm going to really focus on highlighting some of our district goals and the people and programs and partnerships that help us accomplish our goals for our kids. So I want to start with the people who help govern our school district, and that's our board of directors. 
and give them a, a little shout out today, um, as well as highlight the fact that we have a student board representative. And uh, London Moody is our board representative this year, and along with the students who serve on the Superintendent's Student Advisory Council, uh, London uh, provides great perspective and insight uh, to our board and really uh, serves as a true member of our board because student voice is so important to us because, again, that's why we're here and that's who we're here to serve. So when it comes to our students, we currently have over 19,000 students in Kennewick School District that we're serving in programs from preschool through elementary, middle school, and high school, and even up to age 21 in some of our special education programs. We have a strategic plan as a school district that was developed in partnership with parents and community and higher ed and business leaders. And our strategic plan focuses on seven specific goals and we have key indicators of success tied to each of these goals and objectives that we focus on each year tied to each goal as well. So uh, the goals that I'm gonna focus on today are our goals for our students. And we have three student-focused goals. We want all students to be safe, known, and valued, all students to be engaged learners, and all students to be ready for their future. So I'm going to speak about some of the people and programs and partnerships that we have tied to these goals for our students today. Okay, so I want to start with our safe, known, and valued goal. Uh, we have a high priority on student safety, not just physical safety, but social, emotional, and intellectual safety for our students. So in addition to facility safety measures, we have people like school resource officers and security personnel in our schools to help with the physical safety. And then we have great partnerships like communities and schools and uh, uh, mentorship programs through United Way. We've got partnership with Comprehensive Health to help our students uh, really uh, manage uh, emotions and social emotional well being so they can engage as learners. When it comes to engaged learners and preparing students to be ready for their future, I want to highlight uh, something that we've developed over the course of the last two years, and it's what we call our KSD Learner Profile. So uh, this was also developed in collaboration with higher education partners and business partners and community partners because in addition to the academic skills and knowledge that we want our students to have, we want to be real specific about the employment, social, life, and digital citizenship skills that we want to ensure that our students are learning throughout elementary, middle, and high school so when they graduate, they're prepared uh, to be critical thinkers and problem solvers, collaborators, communicators, cultivators, and community contributors. And we know that those are the kinds of skills that employers are looking for as well. So our learner pro profile focuses on these areas, and I know this will be a little hard to read, but uh, it is available on our district website. But for each of the areas, uh, that I just highlighted, we have some student-friendly, like, I can statements connected to each one. Like, I, I can uh, recognize my role in building trust and working with others to complete tasks and projects. That's one of the I can statements connected to that concept of being a collaborator. So what we're working on right now are learner progressions that help us um, as an organization, as a school system, think about what would this look like in a preschool class, uh, in a kindergarten class, in an eighth grade class. So we can uh, be teaching and, and fostering these kind of skills all throughout a student's uh, education with us. Because as I said, our third goal is to ensure that our students are future ready. So it, when we think about the kind of skills that students are learning, we do have uh, a variety of programs to serve the 19,000 students that we serve. And we do have diverse learners and, and special programs in our district. Um, I'm going to highlight just two of those today, uh, one being dual language and another being dual credit. So I want to start with dual language. Uh, we are fortunate in Kennewick School District that we have dual language uh, programs uh, starting in elementary school and uh, continuing through high school. So uh, for a number of years, we've had a dual language elementary school, Fuerza, 
And that's a two-way dual language program, meaning that it serves students whose uh, primary language is Spanish or they're um, bilingual, and students whose primary language is English. And um, in addition, we have been focusing on how do we expand dual language opportunities? Because uh, if you saw on that first slide I showed with our goals, one of our uh, goals about being engaged learners and ready for their future has to do with ensuring that students have the opportunity to become bilingual and biliterate and bicultural. And so we've actually uh, expanded dual language into, um, I have a little clicker issue here, so I apologize, this monitor keeps going on me, but um, we've expanded our dual language program, uh, two-way dual language, to also uh, be serving students at Eastgate Elementary. And so uh, we're continuing to look at how do we expand those programs. They're very popular programs, and we have um, one of our indicators of success is that 100% of the people who want to uh, access dual language have access to dual language. So that means we need to build our programs to meet that demand. Uh, we also then have programs at our middle and high schools. And when it comes to high school, in addition to those um, Spanish language courses, there are CTE courses uh, that help students learn how to be um, translators and uh, interpreters. And so that's a CTE course that we have that would um, be for students, you know, preparing them for a future ready uh, demand. And then, of course, our students can graduate with the seal of biliteracy as well. Okay, so I'm going to shift uh, a little bit uh, to the um, to the uh, graduation aspect and dual credit. And I want to start with a success story. And so I uh, hope that you've seen it. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to look it up. Tri City Herald just did a piece a couple of weeks ago on our graduation success coordinators. And here's an example of some people who, in addition to our teachers and counselors, work one-on-one uh, -on -one with students to help them graduate and be prepared for that their next step after high school. So it was a feature story. It featured a student who was a fifth year senior and his graduation success coordinator and how they work together. And now um, the student is graduating at the end of uh, second semester. And it's a great success story. And I like to bring that uh, up because it's an example of a person <laughs> who uh, works particularly with our kids and the fact that every student's different and some students don't graduate in four years, they need five years to graduate. And that's okay, we want to uh, ensure that our schools are there and supporting kids, whether they need four years or five years or even more to graduate. And so one of our indicators of success that we look at in addition to our four-year graduation rate as a school system is our five-year graduation rate. And we're nearing the 90% mark for um, five-year graduation. And so we know that you know, we talk a lot about preparing students for success after high school, and the first step in that is being successful in high school and earning your high school diploma. And so we want to make sure that our students have that opportunity and are ready for their next step. So when it comes to helping them get ready for their next step, that's where dual credit is a big piece of that. So I want to talk about dual credit. These are CTE. Uh, classes as well as other classes that help students earn college credit while they're in high school or earn post-secondary credit while they're in high school. We know statistics show that two-thirds of jobs uh, require some sort of post-high school education or training and that when students have the opportunity to earn college credit in high school, it gives them a sense of success and that uh, uh, understanding that they are capable of uh, pursuing uh, post-secondary education, and it saves schools uh, and families, it saves families and students money because they're earning credit while they're still in high school. So that's one of the key indicators that we pay close attention to. We have advanced placement courses, international baccalaureate offerings, uh, Running Start, College in the High School, which is uh, partnering with our higher ed partners, and career and technical education courses that allow students to earn that high school that college credit along with their high school credit. So uh, we also take a look at what types of uh, credit students are earning. Right now we have about 72% of our students who graduate having uh, earned dual credit while in high school. And so that's something we're continuing to look at and we want to increase. Um, and then we also look at the types of dual credit students are earning. And you can see from the graph, the gray area is uh, CTE. 
So many of our students participate in CTE courses and earn that high school dual credit. When it comes to CTE in Kennewick, we are the host district uh, for TriTech, and so TriTech has amazing offerings um, for students, not just for Kennewick students, but for um, all of the students uh, and the member districts that TriTech serves. And all of us have uh, students who attend TriTech and uh, have the opportunity to, to uh, take that coursework. In Kennewick specifically, we've got agriculture, health science, STEM, uh, skilled and technical, business and marketing, and family and consumer science. And so I think I'm probably running out of time here too, but I wanted to take a moment to highlight one of our uh, family and consumer science CTE uh, courses in Kennewick. And you know, uh, you might not think about school systems this way, but we're an employer too. And in fact, in Kennewick School District, we're the largest employer in Kennewick. And so we're consistently thinking about how as an organization, how do we recruit and hire that next generation of teachers for our students? And so we have a teaching academy program. Um, it, it is in place at our three big high schools, Kennewick, Kamaikin, and Southridge. Um, we've got great teachers. You see their names there on the screen. And right now we have about 60 students enrolled. And this program um, is not only gives students that opportunity to learn you know, what it takes to be a teacher, but um, through a partnership with WSU Tri-Cities, they get early admission to uh, WSU. They can... Uh, get a job as a paraeducator with us and earn money while they're pursuing their teaching uh, position and get that on the job mentoring kind of a jump start. So that's just one example of how we as an employer even focus on our own industry to help uh, build the next generation of workers and community leaders. So uh, I've talked a lot about people and programs, and I just want to highlight, and again, you know, when you put a slide like this together, you want to make sure you didn't forget anybody, so apologies in advance, but we have amazing partnerships um, in Kennewick with all of the people and organizations that you see here. I've mentioned a few of those today, but I want to really thank all of the partnership so that we thank all the people and organizations that we partner with in Kennewick, because we really can't do it without you. That leads me to my conclusion, which is just to touch briefly on our upcoming educational programs and operations levy, because we do rely on levy dollars to help fund people and programs and partnerships that help us accomplish our goals for our kids. In Kennewick, we have a levy coming up that will help provide us with resources to make our schools safer, to continue to have engaged, future-ready kids, to support our students and staff, to ensure that our facilities are well maintained and safe and we have transportation services for kids and also help us ensure that our students continue to have the opportunities for extracurricular activities and athletics. And so we also have information here and on our website with all of the details. Um, I'll highlight just a couple of things. We uh, have our school resource officer program that is co-funded through the city of Kennewick and our partnership with Kennewick Police Department. Uh, we rely on levy funding for that. If this levy passes, we're going to expand that program, uh, which will mean we will have a school resource officer in every middle school and every high school in Kennewick. Right now, we just have them in the high schools and two of the middle schools. Not only that, we're going to um, have safety officers in all of our elementary schools. So we have limited commission uh, safety officers that can do much of what an SRO can do. You can read more about our plan on our district website, but that's just a, an expansion of safety that we plan to do. If, if our levies don't don't pass, you know, our schools just aren't as safe, our uh, quality isn't as high, and we don't get additional state LEA funding that uh, we qualify for if our local levy passes. So we're really focusing right now on getting our message out about what we're trying to accomplish for kids in our community here in Kennewick and how our levy helps us meet our goals for our kids. So uh, election day is on. Valentine's Day, great time to show the love. So uh, with that, I will uh, close and again, appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Wow, there's a, there's a lot there. Um, and I'm sure that our next speaker has a lot to share too. So um, we're gonna hear from Michelle Whitney. 
Superintendent Whitney has been a part of the Pasco School District for almost 30 years, um, starting out as a kindergarten teacher before moving on to serve as assistant principal and then principal at McLaughlin Middle School. She's also served as, a, as the district's director of human resources, executive director of teaching and learning, and the deputy superintendent. In July 2016, she was sworn in as Pasco School District's new superintendent and has hit the ground running. She's been running ever since, overseeing a school district with more than 2,500 employees that serves more than 18,000 students in our community. Mrs. Whitney is a proud product of Columbia Basin College, where she received her associate's degree before moving on to Washington State University to earn her bachelor's in education and a master's in counseling. She also received her principal's certification and superintendent's credential from WSU. Please help me welcome Superintendent Michelle Whitney. So thank you so much. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. If you're a Pasco School District employee, can you please stand up? I see you in the back, so please stand up. So I have the phenomenal opportunity to serve the community of Pasco as superintendent in partnership with an amazing team. If we could acknowledge them this afternoon, I would appreciate it. So I also want to acknowledge, but I'm not going to ask her to stand, I actually have a sister-in-law in the audience today. So I was born as an only child and married into a relationship where I now have a sister. So I'm not going to ask her to stand. I'll let her decide if she wants to claim me at the end of this presentation. But I do want to acknowledge I have family in the room today, which is new for me. I've never presented in a room where I have a family member. So there's an extra level of pressure this afternoon. Um, but I'm proud and honored to be here. You will hear alignment with both Shelley and Tracy's presentations, which for me is awesome to go last because there's a lot of context. But I will start this way. We serve the community of Pasco in 25 schools. And I want to call out, we're at a nine, just over 19,000 students, 19,252 students. Those of you who've been in this community as long as me, that is outrageous to me. We used to be the smallest school district of the three, and now we're the largest. So it's just a testament to the thriving economy and the, the booming community of Pasco. We are demographic in Pasco. 33% of our kids, about 30, almost 34% of our kids are designated as English learners. But 56% of our kids already come to us having another language at home, which I'll make a connection of why that statistic is really important to us. We have 2,600, a little over 2,600 dedicated employees who dig in on behalf of those students every day to create and develop and deliver quality programming. The reason I highlight and amplify the 56% of our students who come to us already with another language other than English is to highlight our bilingual or our dual language programs. We have a continuum of six different programs in our district that are designed to meet the language needs of our community. Our goal, like Kennewick, is that 100% of our students who need to or want to engage in the journey of bilingualism, biliteracy, and bicultural competency can do that starting in kindergarten in our organization and be supported in both English and Spanish K-12 and exit our system with a deep and robust understanding of language and what it means to be part of a, of a community and a society that embraces bilingualism and biculturalism. 76% of our students between Pasco High and Chihuahua High School graduated with a high school diploma and received that seal of biliteracy, which is an extra certification around their language development. In Pasco, we commit to five outrageous outcomes that when combined create a trajectory of success for our students where they read on grade level in their language of instruction in third grade. That's very important to us to amplify in their language of instruction. They pass algebra by the end of ninth grade. They may do it in seventh and eighth, but they need to by the end of ninth. We want all of our students to be on track for graduation by the end of ninth grade. Statistically, if students are not on track at the end of ninth grade, they're 40 to 60% more likely to drop out. So when I took over in Pasco in 2016, that percentage in Pasco was 36%. 36% of our ninth graders were on track at the end of ninth grade. So does that make you gasp a little? It did me too. So we dug in around that. I'm happy to report that pre-pandemic, we were at almost 80% of our ninth graders are on track for graduation. The pandemic, 
we have a little blip in our, our data, but we'll double down in those systems that we know are important for our students and we're confident that that statistic will bounce back. We want our students to graduate from high school, but not just graduate, have graduate with a career path and even having taken some steps toward that career path when they're with us at the high school level. And I'll try to draw those connections out in my presentation as we move forward. And then we want 100% of our students to have meaningful connections and hope for the future. That particular goal came from the voice of our students. My superintendent student advisory council told me I got the first five goals wrong, I was missing one. So they helped me get it right, and this is their voice, and this is what they're asking us for. They want to have meaningful connections and hope for their future. You will see that like the chamber who has committed to workforce development, I just want to express my gratitude for, to them for amplifying that with the addition of their uh, personnel and partnerships in 2020. We believe that career and technical education is an important part of how we meet those outrageous outcomes and contribute to workforce development in the community that we all love. We do that through focusing on developing career paths. And we start that journey really in elementary school where we've committed to a program called AVID, Advancement via Individual Determination. And the core and philosophy is that program is that we build college and career going and thinking cultures starting in the elementary school. We get real serious about that in eighth grade where we start to help kids develop a high school and beyond plan. And then in high school, they have that plan then to drive the decisions they make around which classes they're taking, what opportunities they wanna explore. Every day is career day. That's our absolute goal. We don't want any of these experiences for kids to be a singular compliance checkoff. We did a high school and beyond plan. We attended a career day. We, wanted it to, we want it to be an integrated and woven into the fabric of our students' educational experiences. One of the positions that helps us do that is a, co a community and career outreach coordinator at our high schools. Each of them have that and their job is to help with work-based learning, to work with industry partners, to ensure that our curriculum is aligned with what the industry standards are so that as our students are participating in career and technical education classes, they're actually learning the things that you as employers want them to learn and need them to learn so that they have a leg up as they come to you looking for employment. I want to highlight and amplify one of our students that we're highlight and magnifying through our I Am Pasco campaign. I want you to meet Morgan. I promised Morgan she didn't have to stay anything, but I'd ask her to stand. This is Morgan, clap for her. Morgan is part of our career and technical education program and she is in our auto mechanics program. So her goal is to be an, a female auto mechanic and be the best possible female auto mechanic in the industry. I do want to highlight she currently has a detailing, car detailing business. So if you're looking for car detailing, see Morgan after. So Morgan is one example that we're highlighting today of how our network of support that I just described supports students in real relevant ways. This is Morgan's dream, and she'll start that journey right in the auto mechanics class at Pasco High School. You'll also notice at a video at the end of uh, my presentation that it makes a direct connection to the bond that's on the ballot for February. So we have uh, CTE pathways towards graduation. We have 16 career clusters which are represented on this graphic. So the legislature re recently allowed students to use a, a career and technical education pathway as a way to meet the graduation requirement, which is a phenomenal way for some of our students to meet that graduation requirement. So if students are choosing to do that, they have to take at least one course in a career pathway where they can learn, earn a dual credit, which uh, Dr. Pierce talked about, or an industry-recognized credential. Industry-recognized credentials, um, there are some examples. So things like an OSHA 10 certification, a forklift certification, a SolidWorks certification, certification around uh, Microsoft Office. I'm proud to report, and there's other examples there too. I'm proud to report that almost 1,300 of our students in our school district have earned one of those industry recognized credentials, giving them again a leg up when they go to apply and really you as employers um, a leg up to get qualified or at least people who are working towards some of the qualifications that you're already asking for. That's a 44% increase over last year. So we're extraordinarily proud of that effort, yet my team knows I'm not satisfied until it's 
100%. So 100% of our kids who want one or need one or can get one should have an industry recognized credential. We had 60 or 675 college credits earned last year, over 18 courses um, articulated, which again has that bright line connection to our 100% of our students. We want them to graduate, but graduate with that career path in mind and having already taken some steps to get there. We have had some expansions of our CTE program, and they're listed here, but the one I really want to highlight, and uh, Tracy talked about their opportunity in Kennewick as well, we have what's called a bilingual educator initiative in the teach, for the Teaching Academy. We have, between our two high schools, almost 80 students are enrolled in this opportunity, and through that opportunity, they get real opportunities to engage in classrooms, they go to trainings, so they really are learning whether teaching is really truly the profession that they want to participate in. And then they're also earning 11 college credits through Columbia Basin College. I am an alum, go Hawks, proud product. So 11 college credits, um, so certainly a leg up in the teaching career. So I often get asked, we hear your commitment to dual language programs, but aren't you seeing a bilingual teacher shortage? And the answer to that question is no because we're growing our own, and who best to stand in front of our bilingual students than students who have participated in the program. This morning I had the extraordinary honor of awarding, I'm gonna cry, <laughs> awarding the Crystal Apple Award to one of our teachers, Miguel. Miguel was my middle school student, so when I was middle school principal, he was in middle school, like I remember him as a sixth grader. He became a paraeducator. He went through one of our grant programs where we helped get his teaching um, education paid for. Now he stands in front of a room full of our students who are in our new ProComer program. So they come to the United States not yet having the opportunity to learn English and they're in the middle school. He's advocated for those students. So at the end of the day, a number of them get on a bus, go to Pasco High School where they engage in a mathematics course in Spanish, in mathematics, where they'll earn high school credit, putting them on a trajectory to leave our system with 45 college credits. So this is a perfect example of, of why an initiative like this is extraordinarily important. I have to say, Miguel was standing there with his wife and two small children, and in my head, he's still a sixth grader, so I was having a hard time reconciling those two things. <laughs> So we also are committed to, to extracurricular activities that really bolster the, the academic experience of our kids. Things like student leadership organizations. Um, these pictures represent our FCCLA and our uh, medals uh, shop uh, club that they won an award at a, a state level competition. So these are ways that in enhancing the academic experience, we build connection and bolster the academic experience for kids. So we too are having an election on the ballot on February 14th. We are running a bond, and who better to tell you about it than our very own student, Lorena. Hi, my name is Lorena, and I'm a student here at Chihuahua High School. I can tell you firsthand that students in our Pasco School District love our schools. Whether you're a student or a grown up, everyone who has attended a Pasco school has a favorite teacher, bus driver, counselor, principal, or important person who has helped us learn. With over 19,000 students in 25 schools, our classrooms are over capacity, especially in our high schools. In fact, Chihuahua High School is currently the largest high school in the state, and Pasco High School is the sixth biggest. The district even estimates that over 1,500 students between both schools will be served in portable classrooms this school year. And Pasco is continuing to grow. Did you know that Pasco is expected to grow 32% over the next 10 years? That's why the district is running a bond in February 2023 to invest in students like me and future generations. Bonds raise funds to construct new schools and update older ones. Our district has used bonds many times before, most recently in 2017 to build Three Rivers and Columbia River Elementary Schools and Ray Reynolds Middle School, replace Stevens Middle School, and make safety and security improvements to our existing schools. If the February 2023 bond is approved, the district would build two new high schools to serve 2,600 students total. 
This includes one new comprehensive high school and a new small innovative high school, also called the Career and College Academy. What is a small innovative high school? The Career and College Academy would be a smaller school with a unique program and career opportunities, like Delta High School. This school will serve only PASCO students and offer pathways in high demand areas in our community, such as health and human services, engineering, and manufacturing. The bond would also allow us to add a softball field at Pasco High School for their girls softball teams, make career and technical education enhancements and modernizations at existing CTE spaces at Chiwana and Pasco High Schools, and have money available to purchase land for future schools. The bond will run on February 14, 2023, which is also Valentine's Day and a great reminder of how much we love Pasco schools. Learn more about Bond 2023 by visiting www.psd1.org bond 2023. So in closing, I just want to acknowledge that Leneta then turned around and did that exact same Bond uh, video in Spanish. And my understanding is it was like one take. She like, that was her one take, she was done. So she's now replaced me as the speaker because it takes me more than one take. I also just wanted to uh, amplify the, call or the Career in College uh, Academy as another innovative step that we're taking to work in partnership with you to fill those workforce needs that you have. I truly believe between the three districts, you should never have a vacancy you can't fill. I have a, a student, Tracy has a student, Shelly has a student that would be your perfect next employee. So thank you for having us here this afternoon. Wow, thank you, Superintendent Whitney. I'm uh, so impressed with all the things that are going on in the schools in our community, um, just overwhelmed. Um, and I guess if there's one underlying theme through all of it, it's don't forget February 14th. Let's get out and vote. Um, vote for our kids and our community. So we'd like to open it up now for questions. Um, and before you ask a question, I'd like you to raise your hand so we can make sure we get a microphone to you because so it's important that everybody hears the questions as well. So does anybody have any questions they'd like to pose to our distinguished panel here. I'm from Pasco. I have three children that went through the dual language program. I have one that's in eighth grade now. Um, my daughter graduated last year with a dual seal of diplomacy on her um, graduation certificate, so I was very glad for that. Um, I want to know where um, are the other two schools going to be built if our bond passes? Thank you for asking. So the comprehensive high school, which would be like a more traditional, full kind of big box high school, will be on road 60, um, right up above Franklin STEM Elementary. So there is some confusion. Some people think it's off Burns, off road 100. We do own land there, but that is not the location of the new high school. The small innovative high school will be off of Salt Lake which is by Curie STEM Elementary. And people ask, well, why that location? The district already owned land there that really is only big enough, or it's sized for a school that size. There's very few things the district could use it for because of its size. It's the perfect size for the small innovative high school. Ut utilizing that the land we already own is a, was a cost saving strategy for you as community members. So I have a question. Uh, so if business or community leaders want to find a way to connect and support schools, such as through a special activity with students or mentoring, how would they go about doing that? And I'll just open it up to any of you. Sure. I'll, I'll start with um, Junior Achievement is a great partner, so, and they know how to hook, us, hook in to the different districts and which schools. Another is um, just call our communications department. We have all things that we need all the time. Yeah, I uh, would agree with Shelly. Just give a call, email, email me directly. Um, love to hear ideas people have. We also have CTE advisory committees that are a great uh, way for people to engage and help influence those programs. So I would just ask for Gracie and Anna to stand. Contact Gracie or Anna. <laughs> We have incredible opportunities for partnership, and these are the key contacts for that. So you just need to know two people, Gracie and Anna, they'll get you connected in anything you would like to do. 
Um, also, specifically for Shelley, I just really appreciate um, your comment on the whole language. <laughs> um, uh, the, we're living in post whole language culture right now. And so, unfortunately, I would say the majority of our teachers are coming to us out of teacher prep programs not knowing how to teach curriculum that emphasizes phonics and structured literacy. So how do you intend to support these teachers and students as they're learning a whole new language, a whole new way of teaching and approaching language? How, do you, uh, how are you going to encourage them when it gets hard? Because it's a way yeah. different way yeah, of teaching. It's, it's hard. And it's, um, so we're really working, too, with the undergraduate programs to shift their, their instruction. When I went to WSU years ago, we had much more of that phonics um, instruction. So when I was teaching second grade, I had, you know, but you're right, since that time, it's, it's changed a lot. Um, so we have letters training, which is a structured literacy training for all of our K-2 teachers. And we're about 80% are in year one or year two. And it's like a college course, it's a relearning, but what we're finding is the teachers really are enjoying the course and they're working together on it and they're seeing the outcomes immediately. We usually in third grade in Richland have run around 70% on the standardized test. So our goal is really to start getting that um, by third grade more in the 90s. Obviously you want 100, but uh, students move in and there are other things that happen, but um, that's the key. That's the key. Our jails are filled with individuals that have a third grade reading level or below. And so that's the hump that we have to get uh, people through. Okay, I think we have one more. This will be the last question, then we gotta move along. Hi, I just wanted to say um, thank you so much for coming. I know that you three are very busy, and I'm grateful to the chamber for the opportunity to be here. Um, my question is about mental health, and um, I'm a first grade teacher, love my job, and I also am a supportive wife who runs a medical laboratory. <laughs> Uh, well, my husband does, but I support him. And um, I am seeing a lot of, in my own children, in all of my friends' children, in classrooms, mental health issues. And I appreciate all the things that were uh, shown to me about how you would use the money that we, as taxpayers, would give. And I want to know how it would apply in the mental health area. So in Pasco, we've been very fortunate that our community has supported levies for decades and decades, and we use those funds to target our schools to have a school, at least one school counselor or a proportionate school counselor ratio to the student enrollment. So for example, your high schools have eight school counselors. We also have dedicated levy funds to making sure that there's a school nurse in every single one of our schools. So we have infrastructure that supports mental health service delivery models. For example, I was just in a school yesterday and went in and the, the counselor was going in classrooms and doing class lessons about the difference between being assertive and aggressive. And, and so I, I think I was kind of stalking her. It was like every classroom I went in, she was, and the kids were so engaged and it was so, um, it was really a, an amazing thing to see. She did a phenomenal job. What we also recognize is the impacts of COVID have really required that we up our game around mental health services and we also recognize that our in our local partners are also feeling the impacts of that so to enhance the partnerships the current staffing we have and our partnerships with our local mental health providers we added in pasco uh, teletherapy services through hazel health we paid for those with esser funds we've seen that be a phenomenal resource to fill the gap between what we can provide at school, the need we have at school, and what we can provide at school, and the impact that the local agencies are feeling. Their, their infrastructures are overwhelmed too. So Hazel Health gives us six sessions per student to have students engage on teletherapy in their language, which is phenomenal, as while we then assess to see do they need more in school, do they need agency counseling. So it's been a phenomenal addition to our continuum of mental health supports in Pasco. And I'll piggyback on that. We also use Hazel Health, and it's um, basically $15 per student, and it's well and worth, worth the investment. They can at home um, or at school. And also, we added um, during the pandemics, uh, it's called a BIMAS assessment for all of our secondary students, and that's really helped us. It asks questions about their mental health, how they're feeling about being connected, 
And that's helped us really, we have a team, a flight team, that immediately after taking the assessment, they go and meet with those students and get them the support that they need. Um, also a lot more training for all of staff because all of our staff, this is now another important part of their role is what to watch for. Um, and then also asking is caring is a new program that we have parents teaching parents. Um, and we run these in the evening. Uh, what to look for, suicide prevention, and supporting families that have gone through suicide. So we have three families that actually have lost children that are helping lead this in uh, the Richland School District. So I just um, add to what's been said and just highlight um, that in addition to school counselors and nurses and expanding those positions, uh, we partner with Comprehensive Health and um, there's a mental health uh, counselor now through that partnership um, for our middle schools and high school students. Um, we've adopted this social emotional learning standards that are the state standards and have trained um, staff on those and it's a lot about uh, working with students you know, to self-regulate and identify um, triggers <laughs> and um, help them manage their emotions and dealing with trauma. And so there's a lot of similarities um, you know, between the three districts. And we have one more. Okay, one more. I know everybody wants to leave. Uh, I'm Dr. Madsen, uh, owner of West Richland Family Dental, co-owner in Prime Dental Pasco. We're super excited to be in the community of Pasco. We've supported the Richland School District for years, and we're gonna to continue to do so. And congratulations on these presentations, because I wish everybody could see what you guys are doing, the hard work you're putting in to make the school districts <clears throat> accessible, safe, healthy, bilingual or biliteracy. I have children who've come up through both of the school districts. And we've always supported the bonds and the levies. It appeared to me in the last levy there was a problem with Kennewick, at least, passing these levies and so my concern is how do you guys have a plan to get this out so we can pass these to get the funds because I see I'm friends and have patients who are educators para educators and I see the Facebook posts and the pleas for money because when the money isn't there the services don't get rendered and obviously we need the matching money from the state and so I guess my question is um, what's the plan to to make sure that people understand that some of these levies come and go and bonds drop off the money isn't always gonna be an extreme fatigue for people's wallets, and when you're asking for money, I guess my biggest concern is hopefully we can get these passed, because I love the school districts. I think it's great to have great educators and, and great support, so I guess that's my question is, what's the plan to get the message out to get these levies passed? I'm not really sure what the situation is with Pasco. I'm new to the community there, but um, traditionally, I think Kennewick and Richland have had a high, a high rate of passage, so um, that's, that's the only concern I have, and what can we do as community members to to help people understand that these are needed programs. Thank you for that. I'll um, speak about what we're doing right now because we are dealing with the fact that we've had a double levy failure. Uh, we didn't pass in February of 2022. We uh, got 49% voter approval. You need 50% for the uh, measure to pass. And then we tried again in April and it didn't pass again. And so um, you can run a levy twice in a calendar year, so we're out again. Uh, we've done a lot of work with the community and um, understanding what the concerns were financially. Of course, there were lots of COVID-related things that we heard that don't really have anything to do with the levy, but um, this time around, uh, we are you know, working hard. Uh, you know, People haven't really felt the impact too much because we've used one-time funding um, the COVID relief dollars and some fund balance to help manage the loss of the levy. Um, so we've been fortunate, but you can use one-time money once, right? And then it's not there anymore. So we uh, really do have a need and, and we're um, out. I've given close to 60 uh, presentations. Um, I've been on the radio and TV and we've got uh, informational spots on radio and television, um, having in-person meetings, flyers, uh, ballots should drop tomorrow. You should have already received your uh, voter pamphlet and of course that's for all three of us but that's just a little bit about what, what Kennewick specifically what we're doing to try to help people understand the need and where the money goes. We've, we've been similar in terms of this is a different kind of a levy, capital projects levy for Richland, and so we've really been trying to get the word out all the different ways that, that Tracy's talked about, about the importance of the safety components and helping us prepare for a larger bond 
Um, so we're trying to be real measured and not, we didn't go out for the really, I'm calling it the big one, uh, that building a new high school, that's for Richland, that's huge. So we're really trying to be real, more cautious and measured as, so we're hoping that is resonating with individuals as well. And just a side note, I love West Richland Dental. You're, you guys are my dentist. <laughs> See, I'll scoot a big smile there for it. <laughs> I can see them, they look great, good job, yeah. <laughs> so same, we do a lot of the same things. I think the only thing that I would amplify that I know that all three of us do is that we do direct mailing. So if you're a Pasco resident, you should have gotten a bond pamphlet in the mail. Um, we're also doing a couple or a handful of virtual bond information sessions, which we did that out of convenience. It seemed to be something people liked during the pandemic. So at for convenience, we are offering that, but we always, we, we all three of us use a lot of the same strategic communications and attends Myers in charge of that and does a great job. I think the piece that might interest you is that there's data analytics that we use to see where those are reaching. And as a school district, we have to be careful in that the PDC guidelines are very clear about what we can and cannot do. And so some times people are like, well, why is the school district not giving me a sign for my yard that says vote yes? That is a PDC violation. I cannot persuade one way or the other. I can only provide information. So those kinds of campaigns happen through citizens committees that happen in the community that are not associated with the district. So I think that's just an important clarification for all of you to understand is that the PDC is very clear about what we can and can't do. And we take a very like black and white interpretation of those guidelines and don't put the, push the edges of that because we wanna run a, a, an information sharing campaign with integrity and fidelity to those, those guidelines. Great, great questions and, and uh, fantastic presentations. Thank you to all three of you. Please help me uh, thank them for the presentations today.